Get your ears wrapped around the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. All the scoop you need to know from college basketball to the NBA and even March Madness. News of your rising stars. Topics on and off the hardwood. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to the GSMC Basketball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Isaiah Kidos. Today we're going to look around some of the better games that happened in the NBA since my last podcast on Thursday. The two LA teams have had some recent misfortunes ahead of their matchup on Christmas that we'll get into. We'll also talk about the defending champs' historic night, as well as a historic night for James Harden as well, before ending the show with who's hot and who's not. Now the Lakers just had a big contest the other day against the Milwaukee Bucks, and if anyone has been following the NBA this season, you know why this is such an important game. These two have been tied for the best record for pretty much the entire season. They've been going back and forth on who's the best in the NBA, who's going to lose first type of deal. And I'd said it last podcast, they both lost in consecutive days for the first time in a while. So to see them both go up, it's it was almost as if this game was a collision course. Um, you know, it, it was a, a moment where people expected this game to happen. It's kind of an early finals matchup um, just to see where these two really measure up against each other. And it was definitely a great game. Um, the Bucks were the only team that really had any players of great value missing. They still don't have Eric Bledsoe. Um, but the majority of the team... Was very productive, and the Bucks had the lead pretty much the entire game. Uh, their largest lead was 21, actually. They had a big second quarter outscoring the Lakers 42-29. to That really propelled them, and they were able to build off of that and continue to hold on to the lead throughout the game. The Lakers started to make some headway and were playing pretty well, but the Bucks were just too good and held on for a 111-104 to win. And of course... A big reason why that they won this game was Giannis Antetokounmpo. We've been talking about him all season long. He's an MVP caliber player. He's the former MVP of last season. Probably going to win back-to-back again this year. He had 34 points, 11 rebounds, and 7 assists with a block and a steal. So he really did He did it all. And you, I know what you're thinking, but I know what you're thinking. He's probably like, this is this is typical stats for Giannis to have not really that impressive don't really know why it's that noteworthy kind of expected at this point but 34 points he's usually getting those points in the paint or you know some mid-range shots but no this game Giannis won five from eight from three let that sink in for a second Giannis Tentacumpo one of the most dangerous players in the post and crashing the boards and going, getting layups and dunking on people, can now shoot threes. He's been slowly but surely developing a shot. And in this game, on the biggest stage of the year, he really unleashed it. Going 5 from 8 from 3 is great numbers, especially for a player that doesn't typically shoot threes. So now he adds that to his arsenal of a list where he's already super impressive and already extremely dangerous. So if he can continue to be that and continue to make that shot even better he's going to be absolutely unstoppable because he can stretch you out and then blow by you for a dunk or he's going to make you you know make him shoot threes and if he can knock him down you're in trouble there's no way to stop him uh the the bucks had five players in double figures Giannis, of course we just talked about it he's ridiculous Um, but chris middleton his partner in crime scored 15 points uh had six rebounds and two assists and he had the highest plus minus for the bucks with 12 so he was a productive guard. He he played his part and helped the Bucks to a victory. Um, Lopez also put up 10 points. 
but he also had four steals and three blocks. So really, Lopez was a huge force on the defensive end, and I think that was a big reason why the Bucks were able to outlast the Lakers in this game because the big men really stepped up and took over this game. Four steals and three blocks. That's that's very productive on the defensive end, and it leads to more possessions and less possessions for the Lakers. So well done by Lopez. Wesley Matthews, who we really don't talk about enough. I haven't talked about him enough specifically, but he's a really good player as well that a lot of people overlook, I think. He was a great player for the Mavericks, a solid wing player that can knock down a couple threes, but he added 13 points in this game, four rebounds and two assists, and he also had three steals of his own and a block. So the Bucks were doing really well on the defensive end in terms of getting steals. And then George Hill as well, coming off the bench, who I haven't talked about him much either because he's been kind of quiet, but he came off the bench and scored 21 points in this game. That's huge. Having a player that can be that productive coming off the bench like that is definitely something that the Bucks need, especially since they can't always rely on Giannis. You need productivity from your bench, and to get 21 points out of one player is, is huge. And they just played great team basketball. The Bucks had... More threes, more free throws, more rebounds. And they had 14 total steals to the Lakers' four. So the Lakers were struggling and the Bucks were rolling. Um, the Lakers' starting squad played a great game. I mean, they have great stars, so obviously they're going to perform pretty well. LeBron had a casual triple-double as usual. 21 points, 12 rebounds, and 11 assists. And in this game, he actually passed Gary Payton on the all-time career assist list. I think LeBron's now an eighth, if I'm not mistaken. Anthony Davis, he added some great stats as well. He had more points than LeBron. 36 points, 10 rebounds, 5 assists with 3 blocks and a steal. So Anthony Davis is moving up the list for MVP of the year, in my opinion, just because of how productive he's been for the Lakers this year. He's just putting up 30 points at ease, it seems like, and with... As tall as he is and as long as he is, he gets about 10 rebounds a game as well. So he's playing extremely well right now. He's at the peak, I think, of his game. Danny Danny Green also had himself a night and added 21 points, all from three-point land. So he was just a marksman this game, a total sharpshooter. And it's exactly what they expect Danny Green to have, especially with the passing ability of LeBron, Rajon Rondo. They're going to find him open, and he's going to get open looks, and he's just got to knock him down, which he did tonight. KCP also added 18 points, which is definitely helpful, but a combined two points off the bench from Howard, or combined four points, excuse me, two points from Dwight Howard and Rondo were just not enough. Four points total from the bench versus just 21 from George Hill coming off the bench for the Bucks. That's a big margin in which they can't, they can't, you know, come back from that they have to have productivity like I said from the bench if you want to be successful so the Bucks bench performed and the Lakers bench didn't it's no wonder why the Bucks ended up on top especially for a player like Dwight Howard who's been playing extremely well has been that aerial threat that they can just throw the lob to he seems to get a lot of points easily just by doing that but the Bucks are a very big team they have Giannis and they have both Lopez's down in the perimeter or down underneath the basket so it might have been harder for Howard to get that kind of open space Rajon Rondo he's not really a person that scores a lot of points but in big games like this you expect your veterans to find ways to be productive and he did have a couple assists but not enough from him so it was really rough game for their bench Um, later on uh, a report came out that apparently LeBron James played hurt which I'm kind of surprised about at first when I heard it I thought oh they're kind of making excuses for him Um, excuses for the Lakers losing this game because they hadn't mentioned anything before but apparently he got hurt against the game against the Pacers where they lost and he has a thoracic muscle strain which is basically your chest abdomen area or just call it your ribs Um, so he played hurt against the Bucks but I'm not I'm not sure about that I think maybe it could be a case of uh, load management which I know a lot of people hate. And I don't really understand why a lot of people hate this. I think it's definitely important. Yes, you want to sell your ratings, your numbers, your ticket sales. People want to see these players play. But these players want to have longevity in their career. And if they need to take off a couple games to make sure that they last however long they want to play in the NBA, or last for the season for that matter, 
There's nothing wrong with that. They're the superstars. They're the reason this league is as big as it is. So if they feel like they need to take a day off, take a day off. It is a long, grueling season with a lot of back-to-backs, a lot of travel, and the amount of minutes that these players play, you know, is very taxing on your body, whether you're a superstar or not. I mean, for normal people, you would be dying by the end of this season. And it happens for superstars too. They're human. And if you need a break, take a break. I don't know if that's what he's doing. I think maybe it could be load management. I mean, LeBron is in, you know, the the latter end or the end of his career-ish. We don't know how much longer he's going to be able to play. But if he wants to play for a few more years, he's going to have to load manage sometimes. And it's okay to say that, in my opinion. But for other people, it's not okay. So I feel like maybe they're making this excuse for him. Because... Typically, you don't see LeBron getting injured. So if this was really that big of a deal, I don't think I don't think they would have necessarily said that if people were this down or frowned upon um, load management. But either way, it turns out that LeBron actually was listed doubtful against the game against the Nuggets. So he didn't play in this game, but we'll talk about that game coming up next. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines, they got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. We just talked about how the Lakers were taken down by the Milwaukee Bucks. Giannis is leading the Bucks to a great season so far and taking down the team that's been rivaling them in terms of their record standpoint this whole year is definitely a good, good mark for them in terms of where they are in their progression towards the NBA championship, which I think they might be on their way to. The Lakers... Struggled a bit in this game in terms of their bench. LeBron did play well, but apparently he played hurt. Um, he, I, did, I think maybe it was load management, but he did play hurt in this game. So because the injury seems to be getting worse, he sat out against their game against the Nuggets, um, who have been playing extremely well lately. If the Nuggets win, they've been on a five-game win streak, and if they win this game, it'll go to six, obviously. And they've been playing very well. They've been the Blazers, the Thunder, Knicks, not really that big a deal. Magic, not really that big a deal. And the Timberwolves, not that big a deal. But plays, Blazers are a great team. Thunder have been hot as well. So they've been getting some momentum going. And they've been playing really well. And now they are playing the LA Lakers, you know, the best team in the West right now, without LeBron. I think maybe he's resting for Christmas, but who knows. Uh, but it was a really slow start for the Nuggets, but they steadily took control of the game as it went on. They scored 23 in the first quarter, but they followed it up with 32 points in the second, 36 points in the third, and 37 in the fourth. So they really started to get a groove, and once the Nuggets took the lead in the third quarter, it was basically over from there, and they ran with it. Their largest lead at one point was 26. Lakers actually had the lead... 67-65 67-65 with a little less than 7 in the third, and then they just collapsed. The Nuggets went on a 26-11 to run, while the Lakers turned the ball over and committed a bunch of fouls and just weren't playing well. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that LeBron wasn't playing in this game. He's a solid, you know, triple-double walking around, and it, when you take that out, it's obviously hard to replace. And not to mention the fact that he is their court general now he's the one that's handling the ball mostly and running the play so to have a different outlook or different person running plays and you know moving the the ball up the court 
and just running the offense definitely hurts their rhythm and their flow, and I think that probably played a factor in this. But nevertheless, the Nuggets came away with the victory, 128-104. to uh, Most of the general stats were pretty even in terms of shots taken, made free throws, three-point percentage, all the, that good stuff. But where the Nuggets really took this game is that they had 31 assists to the Lakers' 18. The Lakers typically move the ball around pretty well, but just not as well as the Nuggets in this game. And I go back to my point about LeBron not being in the game because, like I said, he's a walking triple-double. So if you add another you know, 10 assists to the total, it's 31 assists to the Lakers' 28. So it becomes a lot more even. And on those assists, the points become a lot, you know, a lot more, a lot more productive. And the Lakers only would be down or whatever, but closer in the game if they had more assists and more productivity. So I think the Lakers definitely struggled um, not having LeBron, you know, lead them to another victory. But either way, I think the Nuggets played really, really well. Um LA also had 19 turnovers, um, and they were just they were just too careless with the basketball. 19 turnovers is not very good, and I think that led to the Nuggets having 22 fast break points. So it was really just easy easy money for for the Denver Nuggets, who you know are a young core, and they really played great great team basketball in this game. They had five different players with five assists. Um, let's break down their stats. Jokic, he finished the game with 18 points, 6 rebounds, 5 assists, a block, and a steal. So he was very productive. He's a player that started pretty slow this season. I've said it before, and I don't think he's been as productive as he can be. Even these stats aren't necessarily jumping off the page to me. I think he can definitely score more baskets underneath underneath the basket. He was going up against JaVale McGee, who is a good rim protector. Dwight Howard, who's a good rim protector. But he's a player that can stretch out the floor. He can he can knock down the, the deep ball. So he can find different ways to score. He's very crafty, very unorthodox in the way that he goes about, you know, making moves and shooting the ball. But I think he can score more than 18 points, definitely can get more than six rebounds. And we've seen him get a lot more than five assists. He's a player that he can post it up let the offense run around him, and he can find the open men to get easy assists. And this is how he had so many triple-doubles last year. It was good to see that he had a block and a steal, so he's productive on the defensive end, but Jokic definitely needs to step it up on the offensive end if this Nuggets team wants to go anywhere uh, bigger than just second place in the West. Millsap added 21 points of, of his own, which I think was very productive for him. Will Barton had 14 points. 13 rebounds and 5 assists with 2 steals. So that was a big, big effort from Will Barton. 14 points is a solid contribution, but to bring down 13 boards against an L.A. team that is pretty big. I mean, you have JaVale McGee, Dwight Howard, Anthony Davis. You're bumping around with those guys, and you pull down 13 boards. It's pretty good. And 2 steals as well is impressive. Gary Harris played a fantastic game. He had... A bunch of Euro steps for easy baskets that were just very pretty to watch. He had 19 points and 4 assists. And then also 4 steals as well, which is very impressive to get 4 steals. So he had a very good game and he was a big reason why the Nuggets were able to win this game against the Lakers. Uh, You also had 16 points off of the bench from Beasley. 10 points from Plumlee, who is a very good backup point uh, center by the way. I think he's definitely underrated. He's just such a big body and has such a big presence when he's out on the floor. And I think he's very productive as well. And then the Nuggets also had nine points from Monte Morris as well. So really just the whole roster seemed to really be clicking and just had a lot of productivity from everyone. A lot of these players had you know five assists in this contest, not necessarily having a lot of points, but they found open men to get the points for them. And when they're The play is unselfish like that. You don't really rely on just one star to get a lot of your points. Like a James Harden who just drops 50 easily. But team basketball where they share the ball around and each of them get a lot of points. It's going to be more productive than just relying on one person to carry your team. And that's kind of what the Lakers had to do because, you know, without LeBron, Anthony Davis was by himself. So they were kind of just relying on him. 
and he did his thing. He, you know, he was he was productive. He had 32 points, 11 rebounds, and four blocks. So he was protecting the rim extremely well. Put up 32 points. I mean, he's I I feel like he should be averaging over 30 points by now because he's been going crazy. What disappoints me about Anthony Davis in this game though is he only had one assist, and so in a game where LeBron James, you know, your field general, your court general, isn't there to get the the assist. I think it's kind of on your superstar to find ways to help your offense flow. So he probably had a good amount of touches, and even though he scored 32 points, he can definitely find ways to help out his teammates score too, and in doing so, help out his entire team win the game. And so I think that is definitely an, an area in which Anthony Davis can improve. And, you know, we've seen it before where he's, he can get a bunch of assists. He has the vision to do so. Um, but, you know, just didn't didn't find it today. And then there was also 16 points off the bench from Kuzma, who had four rebounds, a steal, and two blocks. Kuzma's been very quiet this year so far. Coming off the bench, I think he's still trying to figure out his role and figure out how he's going to impact the game when he gets in. And I think he's still kind of adjusting to that. But 16 points off the bench, can't really ask for too much more. I think that's pretty productive in the limited minutes that he gets. Also, a steal and two blocks is pretty productive on the defensive end as well. It just wasn't enough. But no one else besides Anthony Davis and Kyle Kuzma were in double figures scoring. So this is my point back to the Nuggets had a very team-oriented game plan in terms of their productivity and how many people scored. A good amount of points whereas the Lakers only had two players in double figures and they were just struggling and now the Lakers are on a three-game skid they're head three-game skid heading into a Christmas matchup against the LA Clippers where you know it's a very big anticipated game a lot of people hail this as probably the Western Conference final right here because the Lakers and the Clippers are the most well-equipped to win the West but you can't count out the Nuggets right now because they are on a six-game winning streak and just jumped all the way into second place. I mean, if you compare them to other teams that are in the West, they stack up pretty well. Houston is always floating around that top top tier of the Western Conference. But like I said before, they're very star-reliant. They're very star-reliant on James Harden. And I think you know they're starting to find a way to implement Russell Westbrook into that. And if they can get their flow... They can be a, di- a difficult team to deal with, but if they keep just relying on James Harden, I don't think he's going to be you know, a player that can just lead them all the way to a championship. I mean, we've seen it before. This is how they've played in years past. They've been relying on James Harden. He had Chris Paul, but it, Chris Paul doesn't really impact the game as much as they rely on James Harden to impact the game, and this is the reason why the Rockets never can get past the Western Conference Finals. And another team... I think, you know, that the Nuggets can compare to is the Lakers, obviously. They're going to stay on top. The Mavericks, when Luka gets back, they're going to be at the top as well. They're, you know, staying around the conversation right now, but without Luka, it's a little tough. The Jazz definitely can make a push, but I just don't think the Jazz are consistent enough, and they're not getting enough productivity from the players that need to be productive. I.e., we're talking about Mike Conley, probably. Donovan Mitchell can take that next step. I don't think he's been as productive as he can be, especially after his rookie season and all the promise he showed. So he can definitely step it up. The Clippers definitely have the most potential to be in the top tier. But I don't know. I'm not sold on the Clippers yet. I don't know what it is about them. But they just haven't really sold me on the fact that they can be a championship team. They have the pieces to do so, but they haven't executed it. And they haven't really gained that team chemistry yet. I don't think they've gotten their rhythm. And I don't think you know they've been as dangerous as they should be. Now the Denver, now the Denver Nuggets are a team that can definitely be in that top tier. Like I said, they're on a six-game winning streak. But the defending champions have a win streak of their own that was in jeopardy against the Mavericks. Find out why after this.
check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Isaiah Kidos. Now, we just talked about how the Lakers are now on a three-game skid after being one of the best teams in the NBA so far this season. They're having a little bit of struggles right now. They just got taken down by the Denver Nuggets, who have been having a better run of fortune lately they're on a six game winning streak but another team that is on a pretty good winning streak right now is toronto the defending champions they just played the dallas mavericks who you know are missing a big star in luka Doncic, but toronto's missing a big star in their own right they're missing pascal siakam right now he's got an injury he's got a groin injury and he will not return until the new year and toronto is also still missing stanley johnson norman powell and Mark Gasol. So they're definitely struggling in the injury department right now. And they're still finding ways to be successful and still finding ways to win, which a lot of people didn't expect, especially because Kawhi Leonard left. And they didn't know what to make of this Toronto team, but they're still they're still staying around. And then Luca as well, like I said, he's got an ankle sprain. He's returning after Christmas at some point. They don't have a set date or a set game in which they want to bring him back. But he has missed a good amount of games for the Mavericks as of late. A little side note, Luka is nearing a deal with Jordan that's being described as lucrative. I think that is extremely cool because the future of Jordan brand is in extremely good hands. They're about to sign Luka Doncic to this crazy deal, which is warranted because now he is probably one of the best players in the NBA. All of a sudden, he's broken out. Last year, he had a great Rookie of the Year campaign, but this year... He's just a superstar. And they also have signed Zion as well, pretty much even before he came into the league because, you know, a lot of people are hailing him as the next big thing. So Jordan Brand, that's pretty cool, I think, to to, to mention. They're getting Luka Doncic signed, already have Zion. So the future of Jordan Brand is looking pretty good. But uh, back to the NBA action. Mavericks versus Toronto. I think Mavericks started out pretty slow in this game. They had seven points after nine minutes of play. And so if you're only scoring seven points in the first quarter with like three minutes left, you need to do something about that. And they did just that. They won on an 8-0 and run to make it competitive in the first, only trailing by three by the end of it. And then they really, really turned it on. They scored... 34 points to Toronto's 22, 22, excuse me, including a crazy half-court bomb by Porzingis to end the half. Porzingis hit a half-court shot. Think about that. A guy as big and powerful as Porzingis when it comes to driving in the lane can stretch out and shoot from Steph Curry range. That's just, it's, it's so ridiculous how good he is. If he can do it consistently, he could be one of the best players in this league. He can be in the same category as Giannis, in my opinion, because they have the same type of build. They have the same type of skill set. Porzingis can shoot the ball a little bit better, but if Porzingis could be more aggressive like Giannis is, he could be on the same level as him, in my opinion. The third quarter was eerily similar. Uh, it saw Dallas score 35 points to 21 for... Toronto so Toronto was struggling and it looked like a for sure win for the Mavericks their largest lead ballooned all the way to 30 points if you go up by 30 points going into the fourth quarter you expect to win the game everyone was being productive for the Mavs and it makes the fact that they started slow 
really no problem at all because they had so many people to pick up the slack and they really started gaining a rhythm. The score at the end of the third was 86 to 63. So like I said, it looks like a blowout. And most teams at this point, they probably would sit their starters, you know, rest them, make sure that they're fresh for the next game and just start over. This is a lost cause. So why waste our energy and let's focus on the next game? A lot of teams will do this because it's a long season. We talked about load management. This is an area in which a lot of teams will exploit if you're down by that much. But no, the Raptors were not going to give up. They saw something that no one else watching the game probably saw. And then all of a sudden, they outscore the Mavs 47-21 to in the fourth. And they win 110-107. to I'm, I was speechless watching this game. They scored 47 in one quarter. 47. Some teams don't even score 47 and a half. That's crazy. And they ended up winning the game after being down by 30. They erased that 30-point deficit to win and become the third team in the last 20 years to do this. So it doesn't happen a lot. It's, it's historic. The largest lead that Toronto's ever erased in franchise history was 25. So this whole night had history written all over it. And we got to witness it. How lucky are we? But yeah, I'll tell you how it happened. Kyle Lowry is how it happened. That guy was a man on fire. He was possessed. He was out of body. I mean, I don't even understand how hot this guy got. It was like the Splash Brothers back back in the NBA Finals. He almost outscored the Mavs by himself in the fourth quarter. He had 20 of his 32 points in the fourth quarter. Then add the fact that he also had 8 rebounds and 10 assists for a near triple-double. I said in the last podcast, I've thought over the years Kyle Lowry is overrated. Clearly, he listened to my podcast and he wanted to prove me wrong because this was a fantastic performance. Almost a triple-double. You scored 20 of your 32 points in the fourth quarter. Get 10 assists to make your teammates evolved as well. And you will yourself back into this game. You were dead. You were done on the floor. They were down by 30. Crazy. Absolutely crazy. Boucher is also a player for the Raptors who was the MVP in the G League last year, as well as the Defensive Player of the Year. And he got an opportunity in this game because of injuries. Because of injuries that I mentioned before to Pascal Siakam, Gasol, so on and so forth. And he really made the most of this performance. He had a lot of clutch buckets buckets down the stretch that they needed in order to make this comeback. And he ended with 21 points, 7 rebounds, 2 steals, and 4 blocks. And he had a plus minus of 24. Let me remind you, this was a guy that was in the G League last year. Got G League MVP, so he wasn't even in the NBA. For him to perform like that is performances you, you hope to see. You hope guys that come and get good situations make the most of it, and he did just that. Hollis Jefferson was also great off the bench. He had 18 points, 9 rebounds, 2 assists, and he scored all of his points from 3-point land. So he was another marksman on the night. He found you know, the bottom of the net, and he was big in their, in their comeback. Also, pa- Patrick McCall started in this game because of all the injuries that they've had. Remember Patrick McCall? He's the guy that won three championships without really doing anything. Yeah, he's been sitting on the bench for the Raptors just waiting for this opportunity. He actually had four steals in this game, paired with eight points for, you know, a solid contribution. I don't expect him to blow up because he hasn't been a consistent player in the NBA. He's been kind of riding the bench. But to find ways to score eight points and then four steals, that's clutch. That's definitely needed in order to turn the tides. Because once you get a bunch of defensive stops, defensive stops turn into offensive transition. And offensive transition leads to easy points. And so the Raptors, they kind of found an avalanche of points coming their way. 47 in the fourth quarter. It starts with defense. And four steals from McCaw, he he gave his contribution. The Mavs, though, (laughs) I don't know what happened to them. They just fell apart. They had a huge lead. Huge lead. And they just let it slip. I thought they were playing great. Everyone's being productive. But the problem was they got comfortable. 
And in the NBA, you can never get comfortable because like I've said before, any team can win on any given day. And, you know, you don't necessarily see people come back from 30 points down. I mean, we've only seen it three times in the last 20 years, but it's possible and you can't be comfortable with the lead. You have to close out. That's what the best teams do. If the Mavericks have any real, you know, aspirations to go to a championship this year with Luka Doncic leading them, they have to close out games. They can't blow 30-point leads like this. Porzingis, I don't think he played well enough to carry his team. He had 19 points, 12 boards, and 3 blocks. But he had not that much contribution in the assist column, kind of similar to what I was saying about Anthony Davis, except Porzingis didn't score 30 points. He did grab 12 boards, which is definitely helpful, but he's a big man. He's supposed to grab boards. I think he needs to definitely step it up a little bit in the assist column just because Luka Doncic isn't on the floor. You have to step up in other areas. He's the star on the on the on the court. He's their their leader at the moment, and he's got to do it. Three blocks though, kudos to him. That's pretty good. Powell also contributed. He had 17 points, nine rebounds, and three assists. Brunson, he's been the guy that's filled in for Luka Doncic while he's been injured, and he's actually been playing extremely well. A lot of people would have expected JJ Barea to have been taking the baton because. He's a veteran. He's been in this league for a while. He's He knows how it works. He knows what to do. But no, they want to go with Brunson. And, you know, it's paid off. He scored 21 points, grabbed four boards, and had nine assists. That's really good. That's a near trip, or not near triple-double, near double-double. And, you know, you want productivity from your point guard. It's a scoring point guard lead. And he actually put in 21 points, more than Porzingis, which is pretty good. And nine assists too, so he's doing his job all the way around. There was also 14 points from Finney Smith, 16 from Hardaway. So they had good contributions throughout the team, just not enough. And then I think a big, big loss for the Mavericks was that Seth Curry struggled. He's usually a player that comes off the bench and can score a good amount of points. We talked about him in a a podcast or two ago about how he's been, you know, scoring 30 points uh, or 20 points or so each time he's come out onto the floor off the bench. But he struggled this game. He was 0 for 7 from the field and only had one point in 18 minutes. He did have four assists, but that's just not a big enough contribution. Um, in a, in a game where they needed that extra push, especially towards the end of the game, so every point counts. It's a rough game for him. I don't put the whole game on him because it definitely was not his fault. But he's a player that I think could be a good player in this league. But he needs to con- contribute more than that. The Raptors are a force in the East. They're sitting in fourth right now, but they're one. But one game could put them in second or drop them in the fifth. But either way, they're doing it without a big star in Siakam, which is crazy to me. They're on a five-game winning streak now without their best player. And in an East where it's very competitive, if the Celtics lose their next game, the Toronto Raptors will be tied for second place in a year where they just lost Kawhi and they're not playing with Siakam. So the Mavs, on the other hand, they dropped to fifth. But behind fourth place, who are the LA Clippers, who have had a rough night of their own. And we'll talk about that after this. Stay with us. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts, past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. We just talked about a historic night for the Toronto Raptors. A crazy comeback win against the Dallas Mavericks after being down by 30. That's only happened 
three times in the last 20 years. And they scored 47 points in the fourth quarter to do it with Kyle Lowry scoring 20, almost outscoring the Mavs by himself. Now, the Mavericks were on the uh, on the bad side of history. Unfortunate for them, they dropped down to fifth place. But just ahead of them is the LA Clippers, who have been kind of struggling on their own as well. They have two losses in their last three games. They lost to the Rockets, found their way against the Spurs, and then they lost to the Thunder as well. We're going to break down some of those games. That is, there is a big game against the Rockets. These are two powerhouses in the West, two teams that can definitely fight for the top seed if the Lakers weren't as far ahead of them as they are right now. So we're going to break down that game. The Clippers had a huge second quarter where they scored 41 points to take a big lead, 69-54, into halftime. Then all of a sudden, the momentum that the Clippers had going into the half disappeared coming out of it, and they only managed 18 points in the third. And the Rockets doubled that for 36 to make it a close contest again and actually taking the lead 90-87 to going into the fourth. Now, taking this lead was their first lead of the game since 35-33 to so long ago. So all of a sudden, here they come. They're coming back. Late in the game, it was definitely a battle of the duos. As Paul George and Kawhi went back and forth with Harden and Russ, Westbrook made a tie, made it a tie game with a great finish at the basket and won, and then Harden hit a big three while it was tied to take the lead with a little over three to play. Houston kept extending its lead as the Clippers tried to make a push to get back into it, but it was in vain as the Rockets held on to win 122-117. to 117. In a matchup where this, this was a big matchup, a big marquee battle between two great teams in the West. Houston has so much potential with their new duo in Harden and Russ. And then Clippers, the same story. PG and Kawhi, they should be super dominant with the force that they have you know, behind them as well. They should be one of the best teams defensively at least in the in the league. But they gave up 122 points to a Rockets team where... You know, they've just been on fire. And a big part of that has to do with Russell Westbrook and James Harden. Russ dropped 40 points in this game. His probably his best game as a Houston Rockets. Scored 40 points, 10 rebounds, 5 assists. He did have 8 turnovers, however. So I'm going to nitpick that just a little bit because Russell Westbrook, in my opinion, is a little too erratic for me. This is why he has 8 turnovers because he's just kind of careless with the basketball. He's always got a full head of steam, which is kind of why he's always moving so quickly and probably move, losing the ball a lot. But he did drop 40 and had 10 boards, so a nice double-double with five assists as well. He was productive and a big reason why you know, the, the Rockets won this game. James Harden, by James Harden's standards, was kind of quiet this game. He had 28 points, 10 assists, 2 steals, and a block. I said kind of quiet because James Harden <laughs> has been scoring well over 30 points each game. So for him to score only 28 points, he's man, he's underperforming. I expect more. <laughs> Just kidding. But 10 assists, definitely good for him. Um, you, you don't necessarily expect to see that many assists from James, especially since Russ is usually bringing the ball up the court. Uh, and then two steals is very, very impressive for James Harden. But he also had a few turnovers as well, so... I'm going to nitpick him as well. I know that the ball is in the, their hands a lot, so there's more chance of them to lose the ball, but with as good as they are, I definitely expect more. Uh, Capella added some uh, 16 points and 8 rebounds as well. He also had 4 steals, which I thought was very productive for a center to have 4 steals, and one of them was pretty big down in the late crunch time as well. Tucker had 10 points and 12 rebounds for a very quiet double-double, but a definitely big contribution. And then Rivers added 10 points as well. So all around, the Houston Rockets had some good contributions throughout their roster. And it led to a big win. Um, the Clippers stats, they showed, like the stars of the Clippers, they showed out. But they really just had no help. PG and Kawhi had to do most of the heavy lifting. With Paul George leading with 34 points, 9 rebounds, 3 assists, 2 steals, and 2 blocks. So Paul George really did it all. 34 points. 
is a great outpouring from him. Nine boards, grabbed it down like a big man. Two steals and two blocks, so he was productive on the defensive end as well. Tried to get them out into some transition offense, but it just wasn't enough. Kawhi had 25 points, nine rebounds, and four assists. It's kind of a quiet night for Kawhi as well. I think he definitely could have made more of an impact on this game, especially since it was such a big matchup. I know it's early on in the season, and not a lot of people take regular season games seriously, but nevertheless, this is a big matchup. Same as the Lakers and the Bucks. People might want to downplay it because it's regular season, but either way, you know inevitably they're going to meet down in the playoffs, so it's definitely important to take a look at. Harrell had... 19 points and 6 rebounds. Uh, Beverly had 10 points and 7 assists, but that was pretty much it for double-digit scoring. Um, So that was was tough for the Clippers to swallow for sure. Uh, The Clippers regained their composure, like I said, with a win against the Spurs. The first win for Kawhi back in San Antonio after leaving, which was definitely important for him. A lot of, you know, bad blood between him and that organization just because of the way that things went down. It's unfortunate for him. Um, He definitely could have handled it better, but in the end, he's got to do what's best for him and the organization, you know, can't understand that. That's kind of on them. So it's unfortunate for sure. Uh, But then they lose tonight, Sunday night, against the Thunder, who have won four in a row and are in seventh. They're very good at home as well. They're 11 and five, and they're seven and three in their last 10. So the Thunder are rolling right now. Get it? Thunder rolling? Okay, no. Uh, The return to OKC for Paul George was actually really nice in comparison to how Kawhi was, you know, met by the Spurs fans. Paul George was actually, you know, he got a standing O. There's no bad blood there. Um, It's definitely what you want to see from an organization, a kind of respect, a kind of gratitude for what that star did for the organization in his time there. It just didn't work out uh, between him and the organization. He wanted to go off to bigger and better things. And, you know, sometimes you just have to respect that. As much as you hate the fact that he left your team, you have to just respect and appreciate what he had done for you while he was there and just move on. He deserves a standing O, and he got that. It was a really nice moment for Paul George, but ultimately it was ruined uh, by someone on the Thunder who actually the Thunder got back in return for Paul George in that blockbuster trade. Shy Gilgis Gilgis Alexander matches career high with 32 points. He now has gone back to back games with dropping 30 points and the Thunder are just playing extremely well. So for them for the Thunder to get this player and he be the reason why the Clippers, his old team, lost is definitely poetic for sure because you would think it would be the other way around. Paul George going to the Clippers, making his old team lose. But no, Thunder find a way to win. OKC actually trailed at one point by 18 points, making it the third time in seven days that they came back from that much down to win. And against the number two team in the in the West at the time, ain't bad. That's pretty good. So it's definitely impressive to see that, you know, they're finding ways to grind out these wins after... Early on in the season, they were, you know, giving up a lot of leads and finding themselves on the back, on the wrong side of of a game and losing a lot of games that way. But now they're doing their own grind work. They're finding ways to win the games. And, you know, against the Clippers, who should be one of the best teams in the West, it's definitely impressive. A big reason why the Clippers couldn't sustain their lead and win this game is Kawhi was, was sitting with left knee soreness. Did I forget to mention that? Kawhi didn't play in this game. Thunder still win. Um, but Kawhi, yeah, he did not play. He has left knee soreness, but wait a minute. He didn't play tonight. And then LeBron didn't play in his game. So do you think maybe just maybe they're both resting up for their big matchup on Christmas day, the Clippers and the Lakers, Kawhi's resting, LeBron's resting for their big clash. I mean, it's just a conspiracy theory, but I definitely think it's, it's warranted. Definitely worth looking at. Anyway, moving on, Schroeder Schroeder scored 16 points in the fourth quarter, which was huge, Um, especially since the fact that he's coming off the bench. Chris Paul is the main starter for the Thunder, so coming off the bench scoring 16 just in the fourth quarter was definitely huge for the Thunder. Another big moment was when Harrell had scored and been fouled, so 
This was going to be an and one situation. But the Thunder challenged it, and it was a reverse. They actually called a charge on Harrow. This was a very pivotal moment. And then the Thunder kind of used this this momentum as one last push to get the 118 to 112 win over the Clippers. And this was the first time all year that the Thunder are now over 500. So they've kind of turned a page. They've kind of found a different rhythm to them. Uh, Paul George was very underwhelming. He was he had 18 points, two rebounds, and three assists in a game where he didn't have Kawhi. So when you don't have your partner superstar, you kind of expect the one superstar to you know, take the load on his back and just carry your team to a victory. He couldn't do so. Neither could Anthony Davis. And someone else as well I mentioned earlier couldn't do it. Porzingis couldn't do it. Um, but they got to find... They got to find ways to be productive. And Lou Williams, he actually was productive. Lou Williams has definitely slept on one of the best players in the league in terms of scoring the basketball. He's been sixth man of the year more times than I can count. He had 22 points, three rebounds, and seven assists. Very productive. Harrell also added 18 points and eight rebounds off the bench. He's been playing very consistently, very, very well coming off the bench. He can actually make a case for sixth man of the year as well. Uh, Shamit added 14 points with two steals, but it just wasn't enough. Uh, Steven Adams had a big game for the big man. Big game for the big man. He had 20 points and 17 boards and three steals, including one of them in crunch time that kind of led to a layup and kind of turned the page and gave them that momentum push to make their comeback complete. So Steven Adams had great contribution this game. Like I said before, Alexander had 32 points, 5 assists, and 2 steals. So he had a great game in his in his battle against his former team. Chris Paul added 12 points, 7 rebounds, and 6 assists. So not a lot of points. He definitely has the capability to do so, but he was productive in other facets of the game. But Schroeder off the bench had 28 points, 5 rebounds, and 6 assists. Those are huge, huge minutes to put them over the top. This is the reason why they won. Because Schroeder came off the bench and became super productive and just found ways to impact the game. 28 points, huge. Especially since, you know, your starting point guard and Chris Paul only managed 12. So, yeah, Schroeder's definitely a player that has a lot of potential and just hasn't gotten the right opportunity. I've seen him at the Hawks. I've seen him behind, you know, Russell Westbrook. But maybe now on this Thunder team that's kind of in a rebuild, he can kind of break out and be one of the better players on this team. Uh, The Clippers, though, like I said before, they have not been convincing to me. The Thunder were a hot team coming into this game, but I don't think they're that great this year. They have some decent pieces, but not enough to beat the Clippers, or at least they shouldn't have enough to beat the Clippers, especially if the Clippers are at the top of their game. They didn't have Kawhi, but still, I think they they should be be able to manage to win this game. The Rockets, however, have a lot of potential, and they're sitting in third right now. So we'll break down their game against the Suns coming up next. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. We just talked about how the Thunder took down 
the LA Clippers for, you know, a good, good victory for the Thunder in a season where they started out pretty slow, but now they're starting to get some rhythm. And it's starting to make me question, you know, whether or not the Clippers have been, you know, very good. The Thunder are making some headway in the West, but a team that also is making some headway in the West is the Houston Rockets, who had a game of their own against the Phoenix Suns. And the reason why we're going to talk about this game is because James Harden is ridiculously good. He is so good. He scored 47 points in this game. That moves him to fourth on the list of the most 40-point games in NBA history. It's actually very similar to what you know we talked about a few podcasts ago where he was fourth in 50-point games in terms of his company. So now... We're talking about 40-point games, not 50-point games. He's still behind Kobe, Michael, and Wilt on this list as well. Harden right now has 89 games where he's scored 40 points, which is crazy to me. Kobe had 122, so I definitely think Harden will pass him. I mean, he's got a lot left in the tank. He's still relatively young, and the way that he plays the game, I still think he'll be able to find ways to score. And so... Whether or not his, you know, he won't be as quick, he won't be as agile, I don't think it really matters because he's got a flamethrower of jump shot. So he'll definitely find ways to score 40 points more times than 122. Michael had 173, which is going to be tougher to reach, but he definitely will, I think, by the end of his career. But there's no way he's catching number one. And number one, of course, is Wilt Chamberlain. He had 271 games where he had 40 points or more. I think Harden will pass everyone, like I said, but not Wilt. I think I think Wilt's untouchable just because he was ridiculous. He scored at will. James Harden, though, you know, he's he's an extremely good player just because of the way that he can score the basketball. He has so many different facets to his game. He can get to the line and get all his points like that. He can get to the basket, and he's very crafty off the glass, finds ways to lay it in. And then he can shoot from deep as well. He can he his famous move, the step back, is deadly. Like you know it's going to happen, but you still can't stop it. That's a player where it's just you you just watch it and just appreciate the fact that you get to see it live. Because people will be talking about James Harden for years and years to come because of how transcendent he's been in this new age NBA that Steph Curry created where three-point ball is the most important thing. And James Harden has really exploited that and become one of the greatest players probably at some point in NBA history. I said it here, I said it now. Even if he doesn't win a championship, James Harden will be one of the best players in history because of how good of a shooter he is, how great his ball handling skills is, and just how lethal he is. I mean, the guy's insane. Um, Even though the Suns have kind of been struggling this year as of late, you know, they lost their last six games. They've been a very solid team this year, but they, losing their last six games, they're struggling right now. Um, they were bottom of the West last year, or at least around there. Um, but this year, you know, they're decent. They're still kind of at that bottom level of the Western Conference, but they've shown flashes to make them, you know, a little more attractive in the Western Conference. Um, but the, but that dynamic of Harden and Westbrook, is just finally working, and, and there's just something that makes them special, and it's difficult for teams to stop because they're just so different in the way that they play. Westbrook is a put-your-head-down-and-run type of guy. He's a go-go-go. He can push the pace. He can find ways to score um, in transition, getting his teammates open, or just slamming it down himself. He's probably the most explosive point guard in the league, which just makes him so dangerous. But James Harden is the total opposite of that. He's pretty athletic. He can move down the court pretty quickly too. But James Harden is just a nightmare in half-court play. Westbrook can run the full court, but half-court you know, offense, give the ball to James Harden. He's a 1v1 nightmare. People can't guard him. And if they double him, he's going to find a pass to get someone wide open, and then they score that way too. So they are just, they're finally figuring out a rhythm and a flow to their offense to where they can both be productive. And now the Rockets have won 10 of their last 13 games, mostly because of these two. Um, Westbrook kind of started out a little slow in terms of his productivity, but in the last few games, he's been averaging 33.7 points per game, 8 rebounds, and 6.3 assists. 
So the numbers are spiking, and he's really starting to get a flow, starting to get a feel for this team, and starting to get a, a rhythm in terms of working with James Harden, who we already know is killing it. He leads the NBA with 38.5 points per game. 38.5 points per game. I mean, I remember when the scoring champion a few years ago only scored like 26 points per game. But this guy is averaging 38.5 points per game. He's already scored 1,124 points. And that's the most through 29 games since Rick Barry, who had 1,134 in 1966-1967. So yeah, James Harden is just, he's crazy. It's ridiculous. No one scored this many points since 66-67. Crazy. We're really watching history unfold right now. In this particular game, the Suns literally just could not handle the Rockets. They just had too much firepower. James Harden, like I said, he scored 47 points in this game. He also added 6 boards and 7 assists, so he was productive in that facet as well. Um, Westbrook had 30 points, 4 rebounds, and 10 assists, 2 steals, and a block. So, like I said, Westbrook is finding his rhythm. He's being very productive. 30 points is very good following up a 40-point game, like I said, against the Clippers. So, he's being very productive. And then 10 assists, you know, that's what you want from your point guard. Like I said, he can steamroll down the court, find open shooters, and get easy assists like that. And then two steals and a block is productive on defense as well, so he played extremely well. Clint Compella as well had 14 points and 17 boards, so he was a very big man in this game. Bringing down 17 boards, but then also contributing 14 points, 14 points underneath the basket is definitely, definitely needed from your big man. And they got a little good trio going on right now. James Harden, Russell Westbrook, and Capella could really be something dangerous if they gained enough chemistry to really be dangerous. Because I feel like in years past, they've had the same kind of elements. James Harden being the head of a snake, where Capella was also off to the side. He was there, he was helping, but he hasn't been aggressive enough to be a contributor consistently and so that facet he's been you know not not convincing for me Chris Paul was very good he's he, you know he sees the court extremely well his vision's great can find open shooters and he can score sometimes too but now that he James Harden has Russell Westbrook I expect Russ to score a lot more points than he did in the first you know quarter of the season And he's starting to do that. He's starting to show flashes. So if he can start scoring a lot more, staying productive in terms of his assists and grabbing boards, you know, he's a triple-double machine. Him, James Harden, who's already killing it. And if Capella can really grow into the superstar, a lot of people know that he could be. The Rockets can make that next jump to a championship team. They've been, you know, so close in in the last few years, but they just haven't, you know, gotten over that edge to be a championship team. But... They're right there, and now they're third in the West. So they've been a very hot team. But where do they land in the rankings of who's hot and who's not? Stay tuned and find out. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? The GSMC College Football Podcast is your ticket to all things college football. Join us as we talk college football from the national championship, the college rivalries, the bowl game, to the Heisman Trophy, to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, the Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Download the GSMC College Football Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. We just talked about how James Harden continues to make history this year. He's now fourth on the list 
of most 40-point games just behind Kobe, Jordan, Wilt. You know, no big deal. Some, you know, names that, you know, just throw out there. No, they're legends, okay? So he's up there with legends right now. He's making history. Just scored 47 against the Suns and torched them. And, you know, they've been they've been a very, very hot team. But to close out this podcast, uh, we are going to talk about who's hot and who's not. I'm going to give you my list of top five for each. Uh, we're going to start with who's hot. And at number five for me is the Boston Celtics. They're currently second in the East. They have, they've been seven and three in their last 10 games with the three game winning streak. And a reason why they're my, you know, who's hot right now is because, like I said, they have a lot of great pieces. And the fact that now they've made that jump to the second in the East, in, a, in an East where they're moving a lot, a lot of moving pieces for sure. Kemba Walker's been very consistent. He's been leading the team. But the other night, Jason Tatum had a big game against the Hornets, a Sunday night. He had a career high 39 points, as well as 12 boards and two assists. So if he can really start breaking out like that, combined with the fact that Kemba has been leading the way, it's trouble in the East. Celtics could be extremely good if those two can really start building a tandem and bring in Jalen Brown as well. They could be a great trio and a dangerous team in the East. Jace, or yeah, Jason Tatum, he was very good his rookie year, and he kind of flatlined, much like Donovan Mitchell did as well. So he could definitely contribute more, and this is a good step in the right direction. A career-high 39 points, Boston Celtics, number five on my list of who's hot. Coming in at number four, excuse me, is the Houston Rockets. We just talked about them. They're starting to get a rhythm with their squad. James Harden's leading the way. He's super, super good, leading the NBA with points per game with 38.5, which is crazy, what crazy numbers. And now Russell Westbrook is starting to get a rhythm as well. He's starting to find the basket more. He's starting to get more points, starting to be more productive. Um... I definitely think those two need to figure out their dynamic and figure out a way where they can both be productive and both still be superstars, much like how the Warriors had to figure out how to play together as well. These two can definitely be the same if they swallow their egos and definitely work together and then bring in Compella as well. That team could be dangerous. They have the pieces around them to do so. They're playing really well right now. Um, They're in third right now in the West. But only by half a game, so they could even jump to second. They're on a three-game winning streak, and they're 7-3 and three in their last 10. So that's why the Houston Rockets are number four on my list on who's hot. Number three is the Milwaukee Bucks. They're not number one, but they are number one in the East and in the NBA. They're the best team in the NBA. They're 9-1 they're in their last 10 games, and Giannis is just not slowing down. In a year where he got MVP last season and went deep into the playoffs, he's not showing any sign of fatigue. And he's actually being playing even better than he did last season when he got the MVP trophy. So I think he's a big reason why the Bucks are so good. Um, they're five games ahead of second place. So I don't really see anyone catching him right now because all the teams in the East are battling two through six. That that clump right there is super close, but the Bucks are sitting pretty right now. They're only number three in my list because two other teams are being are very hot right now. At number two is the Toronto Raptors. We talked about them a little earlier because of their historic night against the Dallas Mavericks. Like I said, coming back after being down by 30, having a big, big historic night. Only three teams in the last 20 years have done that, so huge 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 game but they're also very good because they've won five in a row and like I said earlier on they could be tied for second with a Celtics loss so a team that doesn't have their superstar in Siakam just lost their superstar over the summer in Kawhi Leonard they've won five games in a row and now all of a sudden they could be tied for second after a game where they just came back by 30 they're the the defending champions put some respect on their name they're number two on my list. Number one on the list on who's hot and who's not, the Denver Nuggets. They've come out of nowhere. They just won six in a row. 
They're really starting to get a flow for their team. They just beat the Lakers, which is a huge game. I don't care what narrative you want to spin on it, whether LeBron, because LeBron didn't play or not, that they won this game. It's a big, big step. That team still has great pieces in Danny Green, Anthony Davis, JaVale McGee, Dwight Howard, Rajon Rondo, KCP. They have great pieces, and that's still a great team. So it's a big win for the Nuggets. Um, they are now second in the West, and they're only three games back of the of the Lakers. So they're making headway in that department, and they're playing really well. Jamal Murray is playing well. Uh, Harris as well, super well. And then um, Jokic, he's really starting to find his way as well. I definitely think he could be more productive, but he's making headway. That's why they're number one on my list of who's hot. Uh, some honorable mentions. Lakers, obviously, have to talk about them. They did lose three straight, which is why they didn't make my top five. Um, but they're the top of the West, so they're definitely you know a hot team right now. The Heat are still around. They're still dancing around. They're seven and three in their last ten. Um, they're in that mix right now for you know in the Eastern Conference right now. I think they are third in the East, so they're definitely dancing around that area. Uh, another team is the Pacers, who are making a push up the standings. They're 7-3 and three in their last 10 games, and the Pacers are sitting in 6 right now, but they're only half a game back from being tied for 5th, and they're only a game and a half back from being in 2nd place. So out of nowhere, here come the Indiana Pacers, which is why I'm going to give them a shout-out. And then the Thunder, as well, we talked about them earlier. They're 7-3 and three in their last 10. They're on a 4-game winning streak. Um, and the Blazers have a four-game win streak as well, so I'll give them a quick shout-out as well. Um, now we're going to move over to you know who's not hot in the NBA right now. And this should come pretty pretty uh, blatantly just because if you look at the bottom of the conference, those are the teams I picked. So coming in at number five is the New Orleans Pelicans. They're the second-to-worst team in the West. They're now 1-9 in, in their last 10 games. And to make matters worse, they just lost to the Golden State Warriors. The Golden State Warriors are the worst team in the league other than the Atlanta Hawks. So to lose to them in a matchup where, you know, it's two of the worst teams battling out for the worst team in the conference (laughs) and you lose, that's just that's just sad. The Pelicans have been very poor this year, definitely underperforming. um, But that that definitely hurts for sure. So that's why they're number five on my list. Number four right now is the Suns, just because they're on a six-game skid. They are struggling. We talked about it a little bit before uh, when we we broke down the game against the Rockets. Um, Their last few games, they lost against the Grizzlies, who aren't a great team. You know, they have John Morant. They have, you know, a couple other pieces, but the Grizzlies are not good this year. The Spurs, who have been struggling, aren't that great either. Um, They lost to the Blazers, who are pretty good. I'll give them that. Um, the Blazers are making some headway in the West. They lost to the Clippers, who should be good. The Thunder, who are hot. And then the Rockets, who you know are very, very hot. So they've had some tough competition other than the Grizzlies and the Spurs. So I'm going to give them a little bit of a pass. But they still are number four on my list just because they've lost six in a row. And they need to find a way to get back onto winning ways like they were in the beginning of the year. Surprising a lot of people doing so. Uh, number three on my list is the Golden State Warriors. They just won against the Pelicans, who suck too, but they had they had lost five before this game, and they're two and eight in their last ten games. They lost to the Grizzlies, the Knicks, the Jazz, the Kings, and the Blazers. They do have the T Wolves next, so maybe they can get a two win streak after beating the Pelicans, but the Golden State Warriors are just not good this year. It's 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 a tough, tough year for Golden State Warriors fans after being spoiled with five NBA Finals in a row. But, I mean, losing your superstars like Steph, Clay, Draymond's on minutes restrictions, D'Lo's having to, you know, deal with injuries here and there. It's just, it's tough for the Golden State Warriors right now. And, you know, honestly, it couldn't be a good thing for them, having all their superstars rest this year so that they can reload, rebuild for next year. And I think the Warriors could definitely make a jump back into the top, you know, four and two, top five in the league. Um... But yeah, right now, though, they are number three on my who's not hot list. And now number two are the Atlanta Hawks, who are the worst team in the Eastern Conference now. Second worst team in the league. Tied for worst team in the league, excuse me, with the Golden State Warriors. They're on a seven-game losing streak. I mean, 
it can't get much worse than that. I mean, it does get worse than that. I'll tell you why in a second. But they're, you know, officially the worst team in the East. They're even worse than Knicks, which is definitely saying something because, wow, that's a bad team. They've lost seven in a row to the Heat, the Bulls, the Pacers, the Lakers, the Knicks, the Jazz, the Nets. and But they do have the Cavs next, who are just two wins better than the Hawks. So maybe they can end this seven-game skid. But, you know, it was it, that's kind of a tough tough last seven games for the Hawks I mean the Heat are a great team in the East the Bulls are a team that's very scrappy can find ways to win I definitely think the Hawks could have won that game but obviously they didn't the Pacers dark horse in the East my pick to come out of nowhere and win things Uh, the Lakers best team in the West the Knicks they're not very good the Jazz can be good and the Nets can be good as well so you know it's been a tough schedule for the Hawks and you know a very a very unfortunate situation for Trey Young because he is and will be a superstar in this league for a while. So to have him lose as badly as he is right now is unfortunate. But their number two, number one, even more unfortunate, is the Minnesota Timberwolves. They are on a 10-game losing streak, and that is just sad. Struggling to the max, 10-game losing streak, dropped to 13th in the West. They're They're just, I don't know, out of nowhere, they've just been really, really poor. It's the month of December. That's what's doing it. They have not won in December at all. They lost to the Grizzlies, who, like I said before, are not good. Mavs, who, you know, have been struggling as of late. Thunder, who are a hot team. Lakers, who are top of the West. They lost to the Suns, you know, who I just said are on this list as well, on a six-game skid. So they lost to the Suns. Lost to the Jazz, Clippers. They lost to the Pelicans, which is just even worse than the Pelicans losing to the Warriors because the Pelicans were on a tough, tough skid for a while there. Um, but then they also lost to the Nuggets and the Blazers. So they had some tough competition during this stretch, but Minnesota's just collapsed out of nowhere, and it's been unfortunate to see. But like I said, they do have the Golden State Warriors up next. So maybe, just maybe, they could end this 10-game losing streak. Or, you know, who knows? They're going to end up having a worse losing streak than the New Orleans Pelicans did early on in the year. Some honorable mentions. Uh, the Knicks, they're terrible. They're 3-7 and seven in their last 10 games. But they have won a couple games, you know, as of late. That's why they didn't make the top five. Knicks fans, you can celebrate now. Uh, the Wizards are struggling. They're 2-10 and 10 in their last 10 games. Uh, they're half a game better than the Cavs, so they're not doing that well if they're only half a game better than the, the Cavaliers. But they didn't make my top five, just an honorable mention. The Cavs, like I said, underneath the Wizards, they're three and seven in the last ten, so they make an honorable mention as well. And I think with that, we're going to wrap up this podcast. So thank you for listening to the GSMC Basketball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I would like to ask that you please remember to subscribe to the show and write a nice review. You know, that would really help us and I would really, really appreciate that. So thank you in advance. Uh, Also, if you can please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, I would really appreciate that as well. I'm Isaiah Kiddos. Thank you and see you next time. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program